Welcome, everybody, to the Competition Archery Media Podcast, where we explore all things pertaining to competition archery. I'm your host, PJ Riley, and our CAM podcast is brought to you by O'Neill's Classic Archery. With us today, we have fresh off a big win in Open Pro Division at the last ASA, Chance Bobuff. Chance, thanks for being here. I appreciate you having me on. So, how does that feel? It has been a couple years since you had an ASA win. How does that feel? It feels really good, man. Uh, it, it's it's just nice to have everything come together for a weekend and without really any big mistakes and and to see you know what you're what you're really capable of. It kind of lights the fire, you know, and, and uh, gives gives a little a little fuel for the fire. Yeah, I, I went back and looked, and it was. 2018 since your last ASA win, but that was known pro. 2015 since last win in open pro. Of course, you were shooting known pro a while, but yeah. but I mean, eight years since an open pro win. I mean, that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty neat. You know that. Uh, nice to know I still got it in the yardage department. You know. <laughs> um, it's it's definitely not something that I've perfected by any means because it, it's a God yardage is such a constant work. You know, it's it's something that you have to constantly use. Other you know, keep it polished. Otherwise, it is it, lower. You'll get rusty quick. Yeah, it, it, uh, one will come out of nowhere and bite you, and you just it'll leave you standing there just wondering how you missed it. <laughs> <laughs> is that something that you go out and practice just judging? Is that part of your practice routine or do you do that while you're shooting or how does that work for you? I incorporate it while I'm shooting. Um, it's so monotonous just to go out with a range finder and look at targets. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm like just about everybody else that if I do try and go out and look at targets with just a range finder, I get, you know, I, I get sidetracked so bad and, and <laughs> you know, have squirrel moments and, and just lose focus of what I'm out there actually trying to work on. Whereas if I try and do it during my practice routine while I'm out shooting, it's, you know, I, I'm a little more serious about it. And yeah. It, it's so hard to replicate practicing what you're going to do in a tournament. You know, everything, when you're at the house, you make quick decisions and you don't really, you don't have people, the arrows to listen to or, different things to to go off of and and it's tough i mean it's it's a it's a muscle memory thing more than anything it's like uh, the way i try and relate it to people it's it's like throwing a baseball yeah footage you know it's something your subconscious already knows how to do you just have to really you have to learn how to to trust yourself and correlate what you're feeling to numbers is do you and do you find that you judge better at home or in competition when you're home by yourself or in competition oh i always judge better at home you know (laughs) you trust your gut more when you're at home the what gets you in trouble at tournaments is indecision you know it is you step up and you have a gut feeling about what the target is but you have so much indecision and fear over if you make a bad decision all right and you start playing more defensively as opposed to aggressively and that's that's what you know it affects your decision making in in uh, high stress situations <laughs> I, i'm always I, you know i'm a huge fan of the unknown game known you know those guys are incredible to be able to hit what they hit all the time unknown i just like that chess match and like you said you, uh, it struck me when you said watching out for that one target that will come back and bite you <laughs> and it, i did the team shoot at fort benning and this still boggles my mind we had just shot a 48 yarder We went to the next target and I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh, okay, that's 10 yards closer. This is 36 all day. And so we're talking among the team and I'm like, yeah, six, I got six. Everybody's like seven. And you know, Bill McCall shoots it. And I said, Bill, what'd you shoot that for? And he says, 47. I said, 47? I was thinking (laughs) 36. (laughs) He's like, no, man, that's four. I was 10 yards off on that. Uh, I mean, I would have totally missed that, but that's like you said, that one target boy in that game, it could really kill you. Oh, absolutely. You know, there's, and 
there's things I do to try and stay to to try and stay on my toes at a tournament to where I don't get caught. But uh, sometimes it just happens, man. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, sometimes there's just one that sneaks up on you, you know, whether you get busy talking to somebody or, or just something, you get sidetracked doing something, you know, you go use the restroom, come back and you don't get to, you get out of your routine and, and sometimes man, it'll just, there's one that'll sneak up and bite you and <laughs> just, you're just left stand there. Just where did, where did I miss that? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, now you won the Iowa pro-am this year, the indoor. Yes, sir. Um, so, I mean, your game's been, you've been working on your game there, obviously. Have you been working on everything like your shot and your judging or, you know, since the past year, what have you just been working on? I've really been working on my execution, my, my shot and, all the with all the new equipment and everything i've just been trying to familiar familiarize myself with it and and try and learn it inside and out and it's it's just something totally new you know not just not just the bow it's the the bow and the release and the sight and you know the whole the whole package so right i'm just trying to spend as much time as i can with it and and really you know work on my execution and it's I've got such a different sight picture that I have had in the past recent few years. And, and it's, it's nice to see. And it's, uh, huh. I've just been working on the mental aspect of uh, things a lot. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that. So you are shooting Darton now, uh, and conquest stabilizers, um, at your level. So you switched from elite to Darton is how big of an adjustment is that from from my perspective not being anywhere in your league it seems to me like oh he's chance boba he can pick up whatever and shoot it it's uh it's been a very good transition um the cam system feels a lot like what i was shooting before i went to elite i I was shooting psc prior to elite and uh the darton technology is you know they they have a lot of the patents and stuff and yeah. and uh, it's a cam system that i'm familiar with i've, I've worked with in the past and, and it feels it's incredibly easy to shoot easy to tune and I, i've uh it's been a very pleasant pleasant transition and i saw it right out of the gate you know whenever i had it i, I had the bow for two weeks before iowa okay and it, it was it was such a it was such a fun transition, you know, whenever I got it, you know, of course you, you get the, the honeymoon phase with it where everything feels great. And, it, you know, <laughs> when you get something new, whether it be a side release, whatever, everything's, you know, it's got the honeymoon phase where everything yeah. feels great. And you kind of, you, you kind of have to shoot and, and let that honeymoon phase wear off and, and see where things actually fall when it once, you know, once the new shine wears off and it's, uh, I feel like it's getting better, so I'm, uh, I'm really excited. Which bow are you shooting? I'm shooting the Vegas ET. Uh, which length? It's 38, actual axle, 38. with an eight, okay. eight inch brace. And with an eight inch brace, man. And yeah. you're, go ahead. I've been, I've been uh, fortunate enough to have a long enough draw length. I'm, I'm a little over 30 and a half inch draw length, and I'm running 68 pounds to get the speed I need for ASA, so. Okay, gotcha. And then run through the rest of your setup because I don't know what sights and release you're shooting now. Well, as of now, I don't have a sight sponsor, so I'm still uh, I'm still looking <laughs> in the sight department. But gotcha. um, Conquest stabilizers, Easton arrows, tack veins, uh, gas bow strings, Hamsky air wrist. Uh, I've been running that for the past few years and have had great success with it. You know, it's just so simple to to set up and tune. And your release, you shoot one of the Carters and. Stan, Stan, that's yep. right. Sorry. Stan, Stan Flosky, and I've been, I'm shooting the button, which is new for me. Oh, I did not notice that. Yeah, I, uh, I haven't shot a button in 21 years. No like kidding. That. This is my first year uh, shooting a button, and but I execute it the same way I have my hinge. I'm, uh, I wrap up pretty hard with my thumb, and I'm pretty static. I, I don't move my thumb after I wrap it up. I just, yeah, I, the motion of my, the rest of my hand fire the release. So what made you decide to switch? 
Well, I I was in the process of changing everything, and I wanted to control the controllables. So I didn't want to be in the process of learning the timing of a new hinge release while learning the new a new platform, a new bow, and and figuring out how that was going to aim. And I wanted I really wanted to be able to see what my sight picture was going to look like without having the the uh, discomfort of a new of a new hinge release in the feel and all that. So. Huh. It's kind of uh, go and, ahead. And your sight picture is what's it doing? I mean, I'm looking at your stabilizer and videos and all I see is nothing moving. <laughs> well, it's getting better. Uh I've been I've actually been working with Stan makes a uh they make a resistance release yeah. that is that is the exact same body as the button release. So I, I've been switching back and forth between that during practice. And it, uh, it just kind of keeps me honest on the back end, you know, and keeps my, it, it helps your repeatability on, on, on the back end, as far as the tension that you're building. Right. It, usually whenever I get under pressure or nervous, I'll find myself building more on the back end than, than normal, which, you know, you get nervous and you start to build a little tension and get, you know, <laughs> yeah. but uh, it, it's, I really find that that's, that's helped me in practice a lot. And it's helped my sight picture a lot in practice. It, uh, it's helped, uh, it's helped me focus on the process more than, more than the aiming aspect of it. Are you using the Onyx system? Is yes. That, okay. Yeah. The new ones. Um, yeah, and, and as you mentioned, the handle's all the same. There's a hinge, a button, and a uh, resistance, and that's all the same handle on purpose. Yeah, that's the, uh, yeah it's a uh, – the first few times I shot it, it's it, it was kind of a wild ride, you know, because it's got a it's got safety, so you draw back with the safety so you don't, you know, punch yourself in the mouth when you're coming to full draw, and you set it to your holding weight or a little over your holding weight, but, you know – when you get back and you you go to drop your thumb off that safety, it's uh, you know it, it's an uncertainty of when it's going to go off. So it kind of it it really helps tame that buildup of anxiety that you get while aiming, thinking that you know you because you're just you know you're subconsciously you're bracing for the explosion of the release, and it, it kind of dulls you to that, which is what we're looking for, you know. Yeah. You, you want to be as dull till that explosion as possible and uh, not because most people, when they get a dip bang, that's what they're doing. You know, they're, they're aiming pretty well, aiming pretty well. And then it's their subconscious feeling like the, the timing is getting close for it to fire. So <laughs> that, it's that, that small, uh, it's, it's just a, I mean, it's just a very small brace for when that shot's going to fire. And that's, that's where dip pangs come from. And, and uh, it, it I, th I really do think that, that practicing and working with that release is going to help eliminate a lot of that. Um, and so you're known for shooting four finger handheld releases. You like those. What is it you like about that? We don't see that a ton. Uh, I started that. Oh, years ago. Um, and I, I had some success with the three finger model. I just, I never could figure out like from shot to shot, my pinky would be doing different things and I would find myself thinking about it every now and then. And I just figured if I gave it a place to go with a full finger, then one <laughs> less thing I could think about. And I just kind of stuck with it. <laughs> I, I would think on the hinge that pinky would give you a little bit of extra rotation. Yeah. I really don't use it. I, I just, okay. uh, my, my hand is fairly dead more than anything once i hit full draw and i wrap my thumb up i i drop most of the tension out of my hand and I, i'm more than anything it's a it's a re relaxation motion in my hand that i'm firing the release with you're kind of letting your hand kind of open up i've heard it explained as let your fingers go through the monkey bars kind of, yes kind of thing yeah, very, very similar to that yeah. gotcha yeah, that's that's cool. How was it for you? You know, uh, Randy Kitts, big sponsor of ASA, big sponsor of CAM. Um, 
to me, it seems like you guys are very similar, two very similar guys. What was it like for you meeting him, getting to work with him, and then joining up, you know, obviously as a dart and conquest shooter? Well, I've talked with Randy in the past quite a few times. You know, he's he's always been very, very nice to me. And, and uh, we've had very good conversation in the past. You know, if, if anything were ever to come up where, I, where we'd be able to work together. So... You know, I, I called him whenever, um, whenever everything, you know, kind of went down, and and I was looking for, you know, somewhere a new home. And uh, Randy was very, very receptive, and uh, it's been, it's been very fun, and I'm I'm very excited for the future. And he's been amazing to work with. You know, great guy. Yeah. Good old. You know, and uh, he'll do anything, do anything for you. What do you think about that? Looking at the field now, I mean, we're seeing a lot of darting jerseys in those shoot downs. We've seen a bunch of them, and uh, it, it's a—I think it's a testament to the product, you know, as well as the leadership. You know, you you, you surround yourself with good people; good things are going to happen, and uh, there's there's a lot of that going on right now. So yeah, it's it's cool to see that out there. Um, it really is. And, it really is. It's, it's cool to see so many different people having so much success with the new platform. Yeah, I there's Madison Cox, you know, out of University of Cumberland's young and women's known pro, and bang, she's out there first two shoot downs. There she is shooting right there with Tanya Gelantine, yeah. also shooting the darting. Look how much success Tanya's had this year? That's, yeah, you know that's that's pretty impressive, especially with the level of competition she's got to deal with. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so for you, uh, you know, I mentioned in the broadcast during the shoot down 16 times you shot a 900 at Vegas three times. You've won it there yeah. is, I mean, 16 times 900 at Vegas. It, it almost seems, I know when Vegas comes around every year, I kind of think, ah, well, chance is an automatic. Obviously, it hasn't happened every year, but most years you're there. Is that, do you feel that indoors as well? Do things just feel automatic to you? I, from the outside looking in, you look like the most comfortable guy out there all the time, but I don't know what's going on inside your head. It could be totally different. <laughs> it's, uh, well, it's never an automatic, you know, uh, I put in a lot of work for indoors and it's, it's, it's more mental than it is physical. You know, there's 90% of the guys in the professional class have the ability to shoot a 900. It's, it's in between your ears and it's how you prepare for it. And whether you're mentally ready, whenever you get to the tournament, you know, you can't like, there's been some years where it's been, incredibly easy and never thought about it. It's, you know, the, the 900 is a complete byproduct. You know, the, the main goal is getting to the shoot down. And once you get to the shoot down, you have a game plan for, you have to prepare yourself mentally that your, your odds are you're going to have to shoot a 30 X. Right. So the tournament, once you get to the shoot off, you have to prepare yourself. That that's, you know, that's, where you're at you're gonna have to shoot a 30 you know so if you just if you're honest with yourself prior to that and you practice for that and you work hard for that you know getting to the shoot off and shooting a 30 in the shoot off then getting there is practice you know even the the rounds the scoring rounds you're using them as as mental preparation for whenever you whenever you get to the shoot off Gotcha. So, yeah. So when you're shooting your, you know, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday rounds, you're actually thinking, I want to hit all the X's. I'm, I'm standing there practicing, working on my execution more than anything. It's, it's, I'm working on the process because if, if I get the process feeling good, it's, it's, there's always good results. It goes pretty simple. Huh? How about that? Yeah. Does it, so now each year that goes by and you, you do shoot a 900, I mean, is that like another, how do you feel about that? I mean, 16 times, I don't know that there's any, I don't know what the next highest number is, but that's a lot. <laughs> uh, I think it may be Jesse. 
Um, I would have guessed. I know Jesse's done it quite a few times. I mean, yeah. we we've been there at the end together a bunch. So yeah, <laughs> he's always fun to shoot next to. But uh, I don't think about it really year to year. You know, it's I try and keep it as a byproduct, man. You yeah. know, it's just part of part of what you got to do to get to the end. You know, and, and I mean, it's pretty neat to have done it that many times and uh i hope i hope to do it quite a few more many but, more <laughs> many, many more <laughs> and uh but i know the i know the amount of work that it takes to get there you know and our our indoor situation around here has just changed so much like over the years i've i've usually had two three four leagues to go shoot yeah you know just to shoot with people to you know, put yourself in somewhere uncomfortable, and, and nobody, you know, nobody shoots around people the way they do at home, you know. And the closer I can get to shooting around people the way I do here, and and putting myself in uncomfortable positions, you know, go shooting with, go shoot anywhere you can with kids, with with you know, S three D A people, you know, people that might bump you or crowd you or cause distractions or whatever because you're yeah. gonna have you know there's gonna be things that happen during the tournament that you can't control and the more prepared you are for it the better off you're gonna be that's interesting i never thought about that but I, you are absolutely correct man when i'm shooting by myself i am super comfortable and then oh, all yeah. of a sudden people are around and i'm not 100 <laughs> percent is so, so if you had to like, do you consider yourself an indoor indoors guy, or do you consider yourself three D or whatever's in season? Just whatever, man. I'm I'm an archer. I, I try and I try and uh, work hard to be the best at whatever venue I'm going to, you know. And uh, it's been it's been pretty neat to have success indoors and three D and just you know doing whatever. And uh, it's it's been kind of a it's been a blessing over the years yeah what is on your schedule for this summer obviously the asas ibos i think i may do one ibo um at, just to qualify for the world because uh they're they're sticklers you know like last year i didn't shoot one and i i wanted to go shoot the world and if you don't qualify they won't let you come so oh, gotcha <laughs> So uh, I, I'm going to shoot one of the the one of the IBOs to try and qualify for the world and, and uh, shoot the shoot the world. But other than that, I'm going to do uh, I'm going to do Reading. Okay. Um, I know that uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're having a shoot in Yankton toward the toward the end of the year. I'm going to do. Oh yeah. All the all the ASA stuff, of course. You know that's yeah. That's uh that's always on the calendar. Reading, you have won, correct? Yeah, yeah. Uh, multiple or just one time? Just one. Just one. one gotcha. Yeah. 2009, I believe. How does that, so that's obviously, you know, that's that super long distance stuff. Do you like that type of archery shooting long distance or? Reading is one of the funnest venues. Um, I love that shoot, you know, yeah. getting prepared for it shooting from three yards to 101 and just the the terrain and the the wind and the weather and it's uh it's a very challenging tournament i mean if you don't if you don't have your equipment straightened out and ready to go by the time you get there you can uh, it can be a very long and painful weekend so uh yeah it can be man it can be fun if you got everything rocking and rolling yeah, I would imagine. I mean, because there, especially in your division anymore, boy, you can't drop too many points. But no. over that many targets, over that what gap of a distance, three to 101, there certainly yeah, I mean, is a lot of room for error. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> you, you just have to stay aware the whole time. You know, there's always constantly, you know, whether it be angles of the hill or the way wind comes up a, a drainage or something, it, it's just something that's all you have to be really aware. There's targets that 
I don't take the cut on that you that you should take the cut on. And, you know, it's just, you learn your tendencies on different targets over the years, and it's uh, it's it's definitely become a game of don't miss. You yeah, know? yeah. It's always in the back of your mind if if you get to a target that's a tough one and you get it, you're like, oh, you know, I needed needed to get through that one for the weekend, you know, just to have a shot. So it's uh, there's definitely a few notorious targets on the range that you have to get if you're going to have a shot at winning the tournament. And it's fun knowing that when you get there and preparing for it and checking yeah. your marks. And I was going to ask, is there one particular that you don't like or the, Target? yeah. Oh, at Reading. The elk herd is the worst. It's 88 yards and it doesn't look that hard. And it's, it's it's the way the wind comes up through the vendors and oh god it's you can fire one right in the middle and not even be close and the next one fire edgy and hit in the middle and it's just it's <laughs> wild man just it, it's been one of the targets that I've had the toughest time to twenty two in Reading is that right yeah I like uh, that one and then right after the elk herd there's a like I think it's a nineteen yard skunk and when you're coming off the elk herd because you get a little bit of adrenaline dump shooting the elk herd yeah so you come off of that and you walk up to those skunks those skunks are nervy because they're a little bit uphill and uh, they're not protected by trees or anything it's <laughs> they got a dot the size of a vegas 10 ring so yeah yeah you got to make two good ones to hit it <laughs> is is there an asa target that you don't like you know obviously the distance matters but is there one of the targets that you don't like one of the toughest ones for me is the turkey honestly huh it's and i've been shooting that target for years you know 20 years we've shot that turkey target but they've you know back when we used to shoot it in ibo it, it had a 10 ring that was you know a fraction of the size that it is the ASA. So, right. But it's something about the the finish on that target, the way that it's painted and the where the feathers are. It's man, it's it's tough to aim on that target at times, and just feels like you're aiming a, at a black garbage bag. We were uh, Nathan Brooks and I during the broadcast were talking because we had a real good camera shot. I might have been during Senior Pro. And it was just what you said. We could see the feather pattern, which really masked the rings. And it was like, yeah. man, that is hard to see. <laughs> it's tough. And you put that thing at, you know, 48 yards and then early in the morning, 730 in the morning, 745 in the morning when the sun is just coming up. And it's 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 literally a shot in the dark. You yeah. Know, it's an educated guess. If you're leading it. Shoot a 10. Go. <laughs> <laughs> we did have a, we had a clip of you from Saturday morning at the uh, uh, Black Eagle Dart and Pro-Am where I think he said like, whose idea was it to start uh, a shoot at 730 in the morning? What, what target did you start on and how did it go for you? It was a Wolverine and oh. it was about as far as you could put it. And the only <laughs> thing when we first walked out there, it was so dark. The only thing you could see was the light brown on, you know, the top, top of the target. And it's just, it's, man, it's a rough one. You know, when you put that target, it, it he had to be, I shot 50 and feel like I fell. So <laughs> it, I feel like he's a little over 50. You know, I tried to play a safe game, played 50 at upper. And yeah. shot, I shot at the brown and black line thinking that I might rise just a little if I put all of it on there and yeah. I didn't rise a bit. Yeah, I, <laughs> if anything, I may have fell a little bit. And so it's, uh, Did you stay 10? Yes, I stayed 10. Thank goodness. Stayed. Did you have any eights this weekend? I, I didn't. I had two on Saturday and I, they were both shooting, shooting it up as I hit just over them. Just got a little too, a little too aggressive. Gotcha. With my number. Yeah, what do you, how would you describe, I mean, the competition back 2015 when you won last in Open Pro compared to now, the scores are like, man, eights, it seems like eights are really painful now compared to a couple years ago. Very, I mean, to win the tournament, you've always had to shoot good scores. I mean, there's there's always been very steep competition in, in unknown. Um I can remember years past shooting 22 up in one day and not being the high score, you know, 
there's always been either, you know, Levi or Dan or somebody there that that's, you know, always going to push you. Yeah. You know? And once you get out front, you can't, there is no cruising. You got to keep your foot on the gas to a certain point. You know, it, you can play a little more conservative, but yeah, you got to keep your foot on the gas and because these guys will not let you go, you know, that it's, it's fuel for them. You know, a couple of these guys, Levi, I know when he gets behind, it's, <laughs> you know, he's got a different gear that he could grab at any time, but, and you got to, you got to stay, stay ahead of him, man. And it's just, it's tough. You know, do you like that? Would you rather be leading or chasing? Always leading. Always light leading. Okay. Yeah. Always being, always want to be the guy up front. You know? Cause it's, it seems like watching Levi, like you said, that other gear, it seems like if he, there comes a point where he just throws it all to the wind and, and if he starts hitting, it's like, oh man, what can you yeah. do? Yeah, <laughs> first thing you can do is make him mad. Worst thing you can do is make him mad. Yeah, I've seen him shoot some just unbelievable rounds whenever he's gotten mad, and uh, you, you don't, you know, you, <laughs> there's no hope of catching him. <laughs> yeah, and it's it seems like a pretty deep field now. You know, there's a lot of you know, I mean, out there there was Ryan Jeffries, Hunter Hogan made his first shoot down. There's always, uh, it, there's a very deep talent, you know, talent pool now. And like you said, there's guys that, you know, like even to make the shoot off, there's guys that are coming from four or five targets back, which in years past, you keep an eye on the first two or three targets. Yeah. You know, you have a pretty good idea of whether you're going to be in the shoot down or not. And now there's some guys that are capable of shooting some big rounds in one day that, you know, They'll come from target six, target seven, and right. knock a couple guys out of the shoot off or off the board that, you know, we have no idea where they came from. They haven't been on the board, but they hit the last five, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I have noticed that I do the scoring uh, usually on your range there. And yeah, it's like you said, you can't just pay attention to those first two groups on the second day. It's there might be somebody six, seven, eight. Oh, this guy's catching fire. You got to watch out. You know, That's, some of these younger guys coming up that uh, you know they may have a, a mediocre first day, right? But they, you know, they shoot their potential the second day, and it's you know they shoot a big round, and before you know it, they're two points behind you. You just don't know where they came from. <laughs> Look at Hunter. You know, Hunter was, he was on the board, but he was like down toward the cut most of the day, most of the day. And, you know, I, and as archers, we keep up with it. We know who's on the board. Right. Well, and then I think it, it, uh, I think he was 18 up with five to go. And then he comes off at, you know, 26. He hit, the, he hit four out of the last five or something. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's not easy to do in that position when you know you got to have them to make the shoot off. For you know, sure, it's it it's cool to watch the you know the next generation coming up and you kind of you kind of watch the younger kids. You see who's got potential and who's got their head game right. And it's it's neat to watch. Do you feel like the one of the old men out there? No, uh, <laughs> I, I don't feel old, man. I really don't. I. Uh, it still feels, you know, it's still a game to me. So I'm still out there having fun. So. Yeah, that's awesome. And so, and you've had a lot of changes the last couple of years, got married to Kelsey there. Yeah. It seems like she's, you know, she's selling real estate, super busy. She used to shoot out there. Does she get to do that anymore? Yeah, well, we we just got her a bow. And uh, I'm we're actually planning on setting it up today. I okay. was going to go work with her on on getting that set up and we're going to go shoot uh shoot a local tournament this weekend and hopefully uh she she plans on being at uh at london and metropolis and the class as a shooter as a shooter all right that'll be she'll nice get her in one of the known yardage classes and uh she'll hopefully work her way back up again yeah yeah and now fishing of course chance i gotta talk to you about fishing because i watch you watch you post these pictures actually you don't really post them kelsey posts the pictures of these I, i'm i think you're trying to keep them secret because you don't want people to know about these big crappies you're ch you're catching there we uh we do very well here around the house and and 
I don't post everything we catch just because <laughs> I, I just don't. Yeah, it's it's a lot. We go whether whether I get up and practice in the morning or practice in the evening, we usually try and fish during the day at some point and yeah. when the weather you know, we try and get out there and enjoy it. And is that mainly because you like eating them? Because I think you guys. Yeah, we. Yeah, I love eating them. You know, we have we have fish fries with friends, and we give away a lot to to friends. You know, and and family that that like fish that don't don't have the time to go. Yeah. Okay. They start a professional crappie fishing league next week. Are you giving up archery for that or no? Depends on the money. <laughs> <laughs> the, the money's right. Chance is going fishing. I'll go fishing 100 percent if the money's right. Yeah. So, Chance, with all that you have won in archery through the years, is there something out there that you want to win? Obviously, you want to win everything, but is there some goal that you have that you want to do? Uh, I'd like to win the ASA Classic. Um, I've come close there second a couple times and never been able to close the deal on that one. That would be nice. I'd I'd really love to get a an unknown pro shooter of the year. I've 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 gotten shooter of the year before, but not in the the unknown pro class. Yeah. I liked it. I've gotten very close. Been on the podium a few times for for shooter of the year in uh, 2017. You were known pro shooter of the year. Yeah. yeah. I've been been very close in years past in the unknown pro class, and you know, there's it's not an easy task to yeah. to beat these guys, you know, over seven events. It's it's not easy. So being at the level you're at, talk about that a, a minute, just for how. What always amazes me is I think about okay, with the unknown, with the judging, like you said, one target. One target, one weekend, boy, can really knock you out of there. And, like, yeah, for target. Levi and Dan to have that consistency, talk about what that is. Because, I mean, you know the archery. I mean, the oh. archery, there's a bunch of you that are all right there equally good, but that judging. Yeah, the, the yardage is really what does it. You know, it, it's there can be one target that can cost you the year. That can for cost sure. You the year, so... And you just never know when it might be coming. You just – the only thing we can do is is guard against big mistakes. And if you kind of learn your tendencies on targets and, you know, there's some targets that I may have more of an issue with, like a Black Panther or something like that, where there's not a lot of room for mistakes low. So you try and, you try and manage it to where – you shoot it uppers mainly on certain targets or or try and play the upper game to to give yourself more of a cushion on on yardage on ones you're uncertain to uncertain because we no matter how good you judge during the round there's going to be a couple targets that you're just not sure about you know you're just uncertain so yeah. you try and play the odds on which direction you're going to miss cuz you can you know as well as we judge, we know we can make ourselves miss in one direction. You know, it, you, you narrow it down to it looks 47, but you know with 45 you're going to fall. You know, you're, you're 100% that yeah. 45 is probably not going to make it there. So you can play, you know, that number at the upper if you're uncertain because you know you'll shoot a 10 or, you, you know, play six at the upper and you know you'll shoot a 10. It, it, there's just different ways that you can manage and work out eliminating big mistakes. But sometimes, man, it's just, there's just one that'll, you know, whether you're <laughs> first on it, first target of the day or the, you know, when you make the turn at the end and the woods look different, you know, in, in London, Kentucky, you have one side of the range is all downhill and darkly, you know, dark, there's no light. And, and on the other side, it, uh, it's all uphill and backlit and, and you can't really tell, you know, you, you, you just can't really tell where rings are or have the ability to aim or anything like yeah. that. 
that that's always what amazes me about the especially the unknown the 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 folks who are can their consistency men and women just that it man you would think somewhere along the line somebody would screw up <laughs> yeah you, you you definitely can't bank on that you got you know yeah as the, those guys are just some of them just have so much talent you just can't you can't hope for a miss. You have to play. You have to play aggressive and and be aggressive. And yeah, I mean, I've I've had it happen before, but it's it's rare that that they get, you know, that they make a mistake. Is so a weekend like this past one where you, uh, I believe you were sitting in third or fourth after day one. Yes, and then second day, obviously, you went uh, in to the finals with a lead, and then you won it. So is that a weekend where you just feel like, man, my numbers are on? And no, no. Just- we, there's always, you know, once we come home and you reflect on the weekend, I missed yardages a lot. You know, there's a bunch of targets I missed numbers on that um, there's always room for improvement, man. Like you get away with stuff that you might not should have got away with. And, <laughs> and there's a couple that got you that, like I, sh- I shot two eights on Saturday, just playing a little more aggressive. Um, the last target of the day, I shot an eight trying to get to 32. Oh, gotcha. And had I not played quite as, quite as aggressive, then, you know, I may have been four, four points higher going in the shoot off. And, and there's just different, a few different little decisions that I made that would, would have changed the weekend in a big way. You know, I could have, you, know, you you just look at it and you think, well, you could have been six point eight eight, you know, six eight points better, going, you know, and those those are times because I've talked with Levi about it. You know, there's times that we've won tournaments that we felt bad about it. You know, like whenever you you get to the end of it and you can't you everything worked out for the best, but you look at it and you're like, man, there's just so many ways that that weekend could have been like really good, you know, you (laughs) just run off with it. And, and those are, you're trying to make yourself more mentally comfortable where you're, when you're in that position, you can make better decisions and, and really, you know, I don't know. It's. So when somebody says it's better to be lucky than good, you say, no, that's oh. not. I, you don't want luck. <laughs> It'll be good. Good's going to last longer. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather rather have the the good aspect. 100%. Yeah. You're going to have bad weekends. Everybody is, but if you work hard and put the time in, odds are that you'll have more good ones than bad ones. Well, Chance, we I forget Kyle. You were at like forty minutes. Was there anything we didn't talk about yet? I know, I know one thing. Randy wanted us to talk about. I think we got through the bows pretty good because I had uh, uh, Jacob Slusars on in, uh, last year, and we just never talked about dart and bows. <laughs> so Randy was like, "Hey, if you get a dart and shooter on there, let's talk about bows." <laughs> so I think we hit that. But was there anything you wanted to talk about that we didn't talk about? <clears throat> A whole lot, man. I mean, the, really, the only bow that I played with has been the Vegas. I haven't had a need to to play elsewhere. Um, I have shot the the Veracity for hunting. Oh, and, right, yeah. Man, that's that's a good bow. That one's hunting I had, season. I yeah. neglected that. How was your hunting season last year? I didn't. It was good. I with Kelsey and I are both doing the real estate thing. Oh, so we're okay. Really trying to get that up and going. So we didn't go out west, and we probably aren't going to this year, just because we're really trying to get that ball rolling. Just so um, archery is, you know, is more fun. You know, right. I, I I can relax and enjoy it more, and and really, you know, enjoy putting time into it rather than feeling obligated to. You know, and turn it, turn it more back into a passion again, because this year has been very, very fun, you know, especially with, with Kelsey doing her real estate stuff and, and getting that going. And it's been, it's been a very big stress reliever, you know, just for this not to be 
dependent upon it, you know, and it's, it's made, it's made winning more, you know, I, I'm not, I don't, I don't really want the money. I just want to win, man. <laughs> you know, like I just, it's, it's a competitive thing. You know, <laughs> I would imagine it's probably a better mindset to go in that I want to win versus I need the money. Definitely. You know, there's, there's been times in the past where, you know, years ago when I was doing it, that I had to win, you know, there's, there was no if, if, ands or buts about it. Like going into the weekend, I needed to make the podium just to, just to come ahead, come out ahead on the weekend. You know, there's still certain tournaments, you know, that are such an expense to go to, you know, Reading and Vegas and a few of the other ones that if you don't make the podium, then you're probably not going to make, you're not going to come out ahead for the weekend. So, you know, it's always a thought in the back of your mind where, you know, like it's, it's an incentive. I got to stay focused and work hard to come out ahead for the weekend. Otherwise, you know, it's a glorified vacation. Right. (laughs) (laughs) And the real estate market, is it, are you in a good area where it is good? Very much so. Nashville nice. has been growing and still growing. And I mean, it's, it's, it's really crazy how just to see in the past five years, how much just around us has, has blown up. And, and, uh, I wish I would have done this 10 years ago, you know, 15 years ago. It's, it's. How close are you? You're in Mount Juliet. How, I don't know. How close is that to Nashville? It's about 35 minutes east. Oh, okay. Nashville. It's gotcha. not, not uh, I can be to the airport in 25 minutes. And it's, nice. I'm, I'm in a really good location for ASAs. <laughs> yeah, you are. That's for sure. It's kind yeah. of a starburst around you. It's <laughs> yeah. I can, be to, uh, I can be to London in, uh, I think London's three hours. Metropolis is two and a half. <laughs> Coleman's an hour and 45 minutes. You know, uh, jeez. Years past, there's been, you know, there was one in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. That was just like an hour and a half. Yeah, yeah. It's That's... been pretty nice years going by. They just, you know, because I, I don't have to leave on Wednesday. I can jump in the car on on Thursday morning and, and be there at noon. Yeah. It's, it, you know, it makes it really nice. All right, folks, that is another episode of the Competition Archery Media Podcast. Chance Bobuff, thanks for being here with us, and congrats on that big win last weekend. Thank you so much, man. I look forward to see you, seeing you at the next one. All right, folks, the Competition Archery Media Podcast, you can find that on all the platforms wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Thanks for being here with us today.